So the landscape, I always like to start with a little bit of market data. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it, but I think it's important to keep an eye on what is happening in the market and what some of the projections are. So these uh, four slides come from super data. And you know, all of us in the industry, particularly in, in VR, AR, you know, we're, we're very impatient, right? We're, we, we want this, this technology to move forward more quickly. And it feels like it's incredibly slow, but you, you can see that it actually, in terms of the evolution of new technology in general, we're sort of on the right trajectory. And it is going to take a while for us to get to all of the bells and whistles that we're looking for, both in AR and VR, you know, particularly with form factor and wearability, and, and really, really seamless user interaction. But the good news is we're not that far away from where we should be. And so the immersive market, this figure has actually come down tremendously. But again, I don't look at that as a negative. I think, again, it's important to recognize that really the shortcomings are usability and, and the form factors. Um, but it's still going to be a very, very big market. And then when you start to think about uh, you know, all of the other technologies in aggregate and what some of the opportunities are for building you know, kind of the, not only just the workplace of the future, but looking at you know, product lines as companies and what, how can you leverage these new te technologies to deliver far better products and services, and potentially even completely different products and services. So mobile AR, which is kind of where we are today, and Blipper was on the stage uh, earlier today, and I do think that, that mobile AR is valuable in that you know, everyone's got a phone with them, right? So it's a very easy way for people to interact with 3D objects. The challenge is it's not a good user experience, kind of holding up your phone for multiple periods of time and trying to see the vast you know, landscape of a room you know, while kind of holding your phone up. But eventually, we will have wearables where it's much simpler for us to see our environment and inter interact seamlessly with these digital objects. Um, and it's also giving us an idea of, of what users care about. That's been one of the big challenges, is that we don't really understand how to interact with these digital environments. The irony is that we live in a 3D environment, yet we don't really understand what that user interface is between the real 3D environment and then 3D digital objects in our display, because our digital lives have, have really been around this kind of 2D screen. And then not surprisingly, uh, the most popular type of AR is social media. And somebody else mentioned earlier uh, this morning that we th there's going to be a new kind of type of social media. We don't really know what that looks like yet, but it will certainly be around these kind of 3D worlds that we inhabit and the experiences that we're having and then recording and sharing. Um, but social media today, we're getting the most interaction, particularly in augmented reality, with like Instagram face filters, uh, and, and there's a whole creator community being built around it. And then 5G, right? So 5G is the big enabler. And this is uh, an estimate from CC Insights that 5G connections will surpass 1 billion by 2023. 5G is a slow rollout, but we're starting to see a little bit of experimentation and understanding what it really means for all of us. Because it is the time now. And again, we want this to happen today. It's going to be a long rollout. So where are we now? Again, use cases, I'm going to kind of run through these especially those of you who have been you know, to AWEs now for three or four years, we know what these are, but I think it's important for us to, to look at them again in the context of all of these burgeoning technologies. Because you know, AR and VR in particular, but you know, AI, blockchain, a few other things we're gonna just touch on a little bit today, uh, it touches every single vertical. So it doesn't matter what industry you are in, there's a, a really a new paradigm in the way you have to think about you know, workforce, innovation, and, and you know, really what, what your future projections are going to be within your, your respective businesses. So simulation and training, we know that, again, r almost every single industry can use virtual and augmented reality in this realm. Collaboration and education. 
visualization and planning, design. So a lot of these are more sort of horizontal approaches again, and that's what my purview is at Vive, is to really look at the solutions that are out there that exist, what needs to be built, and, and make it very, very simple for companies to access these solutions so that they can start to iterate and customize on top of platforms that already exist. And you've seen a lot of them today, and I urge you to go to the expo as well to see what's out there. Emergency reflexive response, again, training in environments that you can't replicate in real life. And using as an assessment tool, right? Is this person right for this particular role? And that's another interesting thing within the workplace because roles are going to be completely changing. And so how do you start to hire a workforce for these roles that haven't existed in the past? So using virtual environments is one way to look at that. Remote technical assistance and field service, Reflect is one of the sponsors here today, and they've been doing remote technical assistance for many, many years. Real-time diagnostics. And digital healthcare, which I think is, is starting to become a very, very in, uh, in, in, interesting industry in that you'll see it in the workplace as well as at home, because I think workplace environments are recognizing the value of the workforce really being, being empowered to take care of themselves, right? Take breaks and to really, you know, alleviate some of the stressful situations that they're in on a day-to-day -day basis. And all the research is showing that it is really important for your workforce to take a break and kind of reset and then go back to work. And data visualization, I think this is a really interesting realm because we have an opportunity now with the vast amounts of data, not only that we have currently, but that we're actually going to be pulling out of virtual and augmented environments and what those interactions look like, and, and actually being able to work with data from the inside out. And I haven't yet seen the, the proper kind of visualization where we really leverage the z-axis, but it's coming. And, and so this is, you know, I love this image, right? In truth, the possibilities are endless. So what I want to talk to you about today is not just, I'll give you some kind of practical solutions about thinking about innovation in the workplace, but really looking at everything in sort of a, a, a much grander scheme, right? A lot, of, a lot of what we're talking about today are very, very kind of specific. This is, this is what this technology does in this moment, and this is how you use it. But I think we have to start a grander scheme of how we are going to build for the future. Because all of those things that I've just showed you, they're already here, right? So that's not even the future. It's really the convergence of all of these emerging technologies that we've talked about. And I know we're focused here on XR, but Again, we can't just go in with blinders on and, and just be focused on solving one problem with one technology. We really need to look at how we're going to leverage each piece of technology for these solutions of the future. So this is my little technology tree. And the interesting thing about this is I could have probably three more trees with as many more branches. And it doesn't really even it doesn't even scratch the surface, right? This is just a, a smattering of the technology we have available to us today, not including technology that we're building on top of, of this. So it's a vast landscape. So I like this slide because I, I do think of us all as alchemists. And I'm not suggesting that all of us be experts in every technology, but be aware of what each technology is and what it holds and how other companies are leveraging each individual piece. Because again, we, as much as now the, these sort of volumetric environments are coming, we need to learn how to be volumetric thinkers and connect dots in a non-linear fashion. And that's not easy to do. That's gonna take some retraining. So rethink thinking, what does that mean? Um, so I hate to break this to you, but this is an interactive presentation. So what do you see here? Raise your hand if you have an idea of what this image is, or if you know what it is. Okay, Christina? 
Okay, somebody else? Anybody else? There's no wrong answers. A cat, okay, anybody else? Okay, so it's a cow. Now, the interesting thing is, next time I show you this image, and it might be tomorrow or it might be 10 years from now, you're only gonna see the cow. And this is how we learn, right? We wait for someone to define something, then we record it to memory, and that's what it is. And we walk away. That's not the reality anymore, though, is it? Right, what's one plus one? Right, what's one plus one in a binary system? If I have one piece of gum and a second piece of gum, and I merge them together, how many pieces of gum do I have? Right, so, so the point is that the things that, that we've kind of recorded to memory don't always remain true in every situation. And so that's what I mean by rethinking thinking. Because it is coming. I love this expression, the tsunami of emerging technology, and that's what it is. I have another image similar to this with the tsunami coming and there's a lone person standing on the beach, completely motionless, right? Because that's sort of what we're doing. We're standing there, we're looking at it all coming, and we, we kind of need to grab a surfboard and get involved. So why is all of this important? Well, IoT is no longer IoT, it's IOE. It is the internet of everything, right? All the machines are gonna be talking to each other, we're gonna be talking to the machines, we're gonna be communicating through each other, you know, via machines, and if you believe in the sing singularity, we are going to become machines. So it is more important than ever to kind of leverage this digital landscape and start peppering these other technologies and using them to our own advantage. And even though this is talking about the future of work, this isn't just about the future of work, right? Because our personal lives and our work lives are inextricably linked. And so it's important for us to, again, have this bigger vision. Big data no longer big data, massive data. And again, that goes back to that slide where you're thinking about how can we work from date with data from the inside out. And we are racing towards the future. I mean, at breakneck speed, right? We need to take a moment and, and assess what do we want this future to look like and how do we use technology to get there? So innovation today is like throwing round dice with no numbers, right? They're just kind of rolling around. They're not really landing anywhere. But that's all we talk about, right? Digital transformation. We're innovators. We have an R&D department. So of course we're innovative. But we're very focused on doing what we're doing now just a little bit faster. It's the same thing. as That's, that's what we think 5G is going to do. It just means we're going to be able to do things faster. But that's not really it, right? We are going to inhabit a complete digital landscape, right? And we have to consider all of these things that we've heard about today, so, which I think are very important as well, sort of safety, what are the ethical ramifications? What are the lifestyle ramifications of having this digital landscape around us all of the time? So innovation is gonna be completely different. So if that's the case, then how do we innovate? Right? We, we only know what we know. Because we're very consumed, again, we're consumed with the tasks at hand and, and doing exactly what we know a little bit better, but it's much more than that. When we think about the future, you know, we're trying to guess what the use cases are for all of this technology, but no one was asking for the iPhone, right? We didn't recognize what, how absolutely important and, and it, it, you know, we can't live without it. Now, I think it's over there and I'm starting to shake. Um, it, no, but it's really, really important for us to realize that the future, we can't guess what it is. We need to start creating it, right? Collectively creating what it looks like. What do we want our work to be like? What do we want our lives to be like? What do we want our companies to be like? All right, workplace. So workplace innovation is one piece of this. The other really important thing that I think companies don't consider is what does the workforce of the future look like, right? Who are the leaders of the future? And if you're a company and you're not innovating, 
you will not attract the next generation of workforce. They don't want to work for you. Why? What do they look like? So what do they care about? Right? Everything is shared. You have to look at millennials now are already 40, right? So now we're, we're even talking about Gen Z, right? So we need to, to understand what motivates these next generations. So what, what do we care about? Sharing, the sort of sharing economy. We're living out loud, right? They, every single thing they do that we, well, we're doing it as well, but this next generation workforce, they are living out loud, they are sharing absolutely everything, they're recording all of their experiences. So you, as a company, if you want to innovate and you want to attract that workforce, you have to look at these behaviors and what's driving them. We want experiences over things. This is one of the number one things that millennials say in particular. Right? They care about experiences. So maybe making a ton of money isn't what they care about. Maybe it's maybe they can work remote. There are companies that you know let their employees work anywhere in the world, right? And that's where we're going to need virtual environments to really work. So that is effective virtual collaboration. We want to make an impact. This is another thing that's really important, right? So an ethical consideration. What are your company's ethics? What is your mission? This is a good time to reinvent that. And diversity is not a mandate or a marketing strategy, right? So when you're talking about ethics, you don't you know, bring these types of you know, diversity policies into your company unless it's real, because it's a necessity. And that's, that is also first and foremost on the minds of the next generation of workforce. They want to work in a diverse environment. We learn daily and we're self-directed, right? They are continually learning and they do it on their own. So that is incredibly valuable. But so how do we attract that talent? How do we keep that talent and how do we keep them engaged? We are in it to win. They, <laughs> It's like they care about their work and their play and their balance. Again, so what does that look like within the construct of your company? And it's really hard as a big company to, to imagine disruption at this scale. But either your company is going to get, you know, be disrupted from the inside or it's going to be disrupted from the outside. And this is the time to make those decisions. And we are impatient. So I, I saw a woman speak a couple months ago. And she's like, she's like a brilliant woman. She's like a double PhD. And she teaches at university, one of the you know, biggest universities in the US. And she's a very, very well-respected consultant. And so apparently um, a kind of semi-youngster came up to her afterwards and was kind of talking and said, you know, I just finished my degree and I just got out of college. How do I do what you do? Like, never mind the 25 years of work experience she had, you know, the, <laughs> this person just wanted to be immediately catapulted into that world. But it is true. It's like this next generation is, is, is impatient. They want to be CEO today. That's why they're starting their own companies, right? So how do you attract the best and the brightest? There's got to be a path to opportunity. And the employee evolution, I don't want to run out of time. The employee evolution used to be this. Right? You kind of nurture, and they, they grow, and they go to sort of middle management, and then management, and, and, and up the food chain. That's not the case. Now we go from Sprout to CEO. Right? And, but, but what's interesting about that is I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Do we really need, I mean, the, the innovation and iteration cycle now has gone, you know, in companies have gone, has gone from 20 to 10 to 5 to 3 years. So maybe it's a good thing that your next generation it can, can iterate at that cycle, right? But you, again, we have to be able to build those mechanisms and put those mechanisms in place for this workforce to succeed. And the future is superhuman, and this is true, especially after the singularity. So let's get practical. So this is the only practical section here. <laughs> 
What is the recipe? All right, so if this is more about innovation, right? And these are the ingredients, again, and I could easily just put, I could take the technology tree and I could make a recipe book out of that, but that is your job. Your job is to look at the technologies that's, that are out there and start thinking about really how to innovate your companies from the inside. But these are some other, this is more on kind of rethinking the way we innovate. So first, live outside the org, right? You can't have innovation now and in R&D. That doesn't mean physically they have to be somewhere else, but more and more companies are using or spinning out their R&D so that they are not part of this sort of specific construct, right? This, this staid corporate construct that exists today. So they're able to iterate, you know, fail fast and move on. And it's expensive. So as a company, you have to ideally invest a lot of money and then you have to give the R&D teams cover, right? So that they are able to innovate without having their budgets under review from year to year, because that's not gonna work. And then when you're thinking about your products and your services, and actually even your employees, right? What is the problem and who is the user? And you have to ask the hard questions. And that is on both paths, right? What are your products and services? How can they improve? Who is the end user? And the same with the next generation workforce. So there's a lot of work to do. And you have to understand the difference between want and need. What do you want to do versus what do you need to do? And I think you can have a healthy combination of both, but you have to just understand the differences. And I think this is the most critical piece today for business, for humanity, for, for how we think about everything, is that I think we need to work backwards from the future. We have to start at the destination. We have to kind of invent the next iPhone and project ourselves into what that means in this digital landscape, and then start today and figure out how are we gonna get there, leveraging all of this technology. All right, so we're here now. So tech imitates art. Right? You've heard life imitates art, art imitates life. But I think tech imitates art. Because it's not, a, it's not a coincidence that you know, AR kind of looks like Minority Report. It's like one person imagined that, somebody else made a film about it. We all see it and we think, that makes sense. And my reasoning today behind kind of bringing all of these elements together is to, for that all of us actually have the opportunity to write these stories. I'm not saying we need to make films about them, but I think it's very easy in the same way that we're waiting for people to define things for us so that we can kind of just commit them to memory. It's the same when we're thinking about innovation and the future. We have to invest in our own vision for what the future is. Otherwise, someone else will tell these stories for us, right? Do we really want Black Mirror <laughs> to be the future? No, but again, we have to take the time to imagine what it looks like. And I bet if I ask most of you in this room, what is your life, even you personally, forget business, what does your life look like in five years, 10 years? It might be hard for you to come up with an answer because we haven't taken the time to do it. So we're gonna run through some of the technologies because this is a big topic in a short period of time. So AR Cloud, we've been, yay, we are open AR Cloud. Uh, so the digital twin, that is really going to be the enabler for our everyday experiences, right? The, you know, AR is the next computing platform, and so AR Cloud is really what will enable us to seamlessly interact with the real world and the digital world. And the magic verse, right? The, the world will be painted with data. This is from Charlie Fink. This is really the, the sort of layers of information. And, and you know, we all kind of have different versions of this. But again, at your particular companies, how are you thinking about this? Right? We are all going to be interacting in this digital landscape. And this is not just about marketing. It's about how we do everything. 
So that's one of, the, one of the pieces you need to unravel. Virtual worlds, right? We are going to inhabit virtual worlds. Are we going to advertise to people in those worlds? We don't know. Are you going to do work in these virtual worlds? Probably. So what does that look like? Because VR is really a destination, right? You're going into VR to learn something, do something, be something, play something. All right, interactive. What's the first thing you think of when you think of when you hear blockchain? No one? <laughs> Cryptocurrency. Right? But that's just a piece of it. It's really a digital truth. And are you thinking about that in terms of this digital landscape and, and how you can leverage that in your company? Volumetric spatial control. So I'm going to give you a few pieces to the puzzle and a, an example of what I mean by volumetric thinking. So volumetric spatial control is, and there's a company that's, there's several companies that are doing this, but um, this particular company has actually gotten a block of IPv6 and they've gridded the entire planet down to the millimeter. So you're able to push mobile behaviors remotely. And so when there's 2,000, you know, kind of AR experiences in here, then they will be part of the mechanism that allows you to see the right experience based on your choices. And then LiDAR. So a big enabler for um, autonomous vehicles, but this is an example. So there's a company called AI, A-E-Y-E, -E, and they dynamically, they're using, uh, it's an uh, autonomous vehicle company, and so they're using LiDAR to detect anomalies in the space so that the car behaves the way it's meant to behave should you know, there be an object uh, you know, coming into the path of the, the uh, vehicle. But they're throwing away so much data that could then be leveraged and to re-up the veracity of the AR cloud, right? Because it's looking for static objects and buildings and, and objects that it knows exist. But there are those that are sort of in play, right? There's a stop sign there today, but tomorrow it's like that. So we can take that data that has no value to them and we can re-up and send it up and, and make sure that the AR cloud is consistently up to date, right? But, but who's thinking about that? They have a secondary market opportunity, as all of you do. I want to make sure I wrap this up in time. This is very important, human-centric identity, right? So we are going to have, our avatars will be our representative in the digital landscape. So we'll have our public persona, which is, again, all of our fabulous Facebook and Instagram lives. And we'll have a private persona. And someone is going to build the UI that allows us to control our data, which is very, very difficult to do. And as much as we whine about Facebook and Google having our data, it is going to take work for us to take our data back. I see a point at which we remove marketers and advertisers, I hope none of you are in the room today, from the brand consumer paradigm because brands will come directly to us. And they, we will allow them to market directly to us. We will give them permission, they will pay us guess what, in cryptocurrency, in microtransactions, until they stop giving us relevant content. And then we shut off those permissions. Right? And that's going to be for everything. But again, these are multiple technologies at play. So in your companies, this is the volumetric thinking. Right? How can each of these, how can you leverage each of these? A, to attract the next generation workforce, and B, to improve your products and services. I'm running out of time. So, the message. Build for how we will live tomorrow. And think about what is the future of work, play, education, entertainment, identity, value, commerce, data security. This is a lot. Right? That tsunami of technology truly is coming. So what is the future of us? So one thing I urge all of you to do is even just for yourselves personally, is build that version of yourself in eight years. Knowing what you know about all the technology that's coming down the pike. And this is not about being right, the exercise is about doing it and what do you want. 
and then you be become one of the storytellers that impacts us all in the future. So the best way to predict the future is to create it. And if we do that, everybody wins. And don't forget to think outside the cow. Thank you. All right. I did run a couple of minutes over, uh, but I will be here all day tomorrow if any of you have any questions. And for those of you who came in late and have no idea what the think outside the cow means, <laughs> you'll be able to see this on YouTube in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.